بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين In the name of Allah the Compassionate the Merciful All praise is due to Allah And may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his Prophet Muhammad His family and his followers all until the day of resurrection On behalf of myself of course today with a very nice uh, group here Dr. Bilal Phillips and Sheikh Salim Al-Amiri and we are talking about the concept of Tawheed. The concept of Tawheed, monotheism, singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship is very central to Islam. And indeed, it is the base for Islam. And without it, there is no Islam. And of course, with today's world and actions and intermingling among Muslims and non-Muslims, the subject is always there to discuss. And um, I'd like the thoughts of my respected uh, brothers and colleagues here. Uh, Sheikh Bilal, let me start with you. And how do you see Tawheed as the monotheism, religion of all previous prophets before the Prophet, peace be upon him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and upon all the uh, prophets of Islam? But uh, maybe the definition could help us uh, understand this concept more clearly uh, well, in today. Well, I, I think that... Um when we look at Tawheed, uh, we need to look at it in the general concept of, of human beings in this world. Uh, in general, people agree that there is one God and that there is one human race. The old people have got issues of races, but in reality, this is really one human race. And the message which God conveyed to human beings because to create human beings without giving them an idea as to what they're supposed to do in this world you know, is of course ludicrous. Once you accept God, you're accepted the idea of, of a message being conveyed. That oneness of God, oneness of human beings, and oneness of a message which God sent, you know, and contained in that message is the concept of the one God. So the unity, the Tawheed, the monotheism, the oneness, with regards to God is one thing in terms of that issue of worship, etc. But it's also in terms of human beings in the sense that we are also one with one purpose and one responsibility. And that the religion that in fact God sent us is one. So if we use Tawheed, as not just meaning monotheism, we use it to mean unity in that sense. That unity goes beyond the concept of God itself. But that's very interesting because we talk about this unity of all of the human race, uh, the oneness of Allah as being the supreme being, as being the uh, deity uh, worthy of worship. Yet people do worship so many gods and people have their own ways of worship. And they say, well, we are all religious and we mean good, we'd like to lead a good and decent life. How does that react to you? How do you see it, Sheikh Salim? Alhamdulillah, salatu salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi man wala. Alhamdulillah, first of all, as uh, human beings, everyone should question himself, what is the uh, reason behind my existence in the first place? The reason behind your existence is to worship your creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلْقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبِدُونَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created jinn and mankind only to worship him. That's the purpose for our existence on this planet, number one. Number two, as my brother mentioned, Dr. Bilal, that this unity or the oneness of the human beings that we are all the offspring and progeny of one father and one mother, Adam and Eve, alayhim as -salam, this actually should dictate upon the individual, the one who made this unity and the one who made us one family, he is the one who deserves also to be worshipped alone. So the Tawheed actually is singling him, worshipping him. You don't set up partners, you don't associate partners with him. That is the, the fitrah and this is the natural instinct individual has. So that's the real purpose of the existence of the human race in the first place. Yes, it's the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to have all these people who are deviating from the path that he wanted people to follow. How do other religions have the concept of Tawheed? Do you think that 
uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, do they have this concept of Tawheed? I think that Tawheed, you know, from this perspective of one God exists everywhere, even in the religions where people say we have two gods, for example, the Zoroastrian religion, the Parsis, a god of good and a god of evil. Yet, for them, the god of good wins out in the end. They're not equal. So in the end, really, there is really only one god. The other one, they're calling a god, but still the main one. Even with the Greeks and the others who had Zeus and, yeah. you know, on high, you had a wife and kids and you had, you know, but still there so was... It's a, it's the a family, family of gods. It's a family affair, but still there is one at the head, you know. So, I mean, we understand that this really is a, a, a leftover from the original teachings which were taught. Uh, Adam, first person created, was given the concept of the oneness of God. And that's what he conveyed to his descendants. But as time passed, then people strayed. So it was an issue of people straying from monotheism into dualism, that's worshipping two gods, or tritheism, having three gods in one, or a variety of other things that people ended up in, you know, where they ended up worshipping nature, gods in all aspects of nature. I mean, this is the way that it went. It wasn't the other way, which uh, commonly now anthropologists and others are trying to promote, that the arrival at the one god actually came from the diversity, worshipping gods of nature, then it became, you know, family gods, and then it became national gods, and as the numbers got less and less, it worked its way down to one. But from our perspective, as, as Islam teaches, and this is the same message brought by Prophet Jesus and Moses and the other prophets, that the teachings began with the concept of the one God. And that's why we find the one God concept everywhere. Even in Hinduism, with its millions of gods, the idea of a one, you know, overall God, Brahma, who pervades everything. I mean, of course, issues of how that God is, you know, we may differ with, but the idea that there is one God overall exists. Well, it's there, but is God supposed to have qualities that really make a God real God? And what is the difference between uh, the God of Muslims, as they call it, and the God of others? Uh, it's basically someone who is being worshipped. Uh, anyone that you take as the being, you worship because he deserves to you, according to your own understanding, the worship that you do, whether it's submission, whether it's uh, paying some homage or uh, coming and kneeling before this God, and that would be it. In other words, what is the concept of worship as it relates to God, and who's that worthy of worship in the Islamic religion? Alhamdulillah, the, first of all, the word God in Arabic, as we, they, is called ilah. Ilah means anything. Any object that you worship, it becomes your ilah. Your ilah, your God. But the true God, that's why we, the Muslims, when they say there's no God worthy of being worshipped but Allah, so that means this is the key word in the definition when they say worthy. There are many gods, there are many objects of worship people worship. But which one is the one that deserves to be worshipped, which is the creator of the heavens and the earth? Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talked about himself, he gave us his uh, divine attributes, he mentioned his names, he mentioned his qualities in, in one chapter, small chapter in the Quran. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, which every Muslim knows, that Allah is unique, is one. He doesn't beget, nor is he begotten, etc. So these are the, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and qualities of Allah the creator, yes. And I would say, I'll add to that, that really, even the term Allah, I mean, it's very important for uh, people to understand that this is an Arabic term. Um, the issue is not about the name, because earlier prophets who came, who were sent, as Allah said in the Quran, God said in the Quran, that he sent prophets to every nation and tribe. So the prophets were always sent, as he said, in the, speaking the language of their people. So whatever language, whatever language they spoke, whatever term conveyed the idea of one God who was not a part of his creation, who created everything without beginning and end, these 
well-known attributes when we talk about God. This is where people usually end up. Whatever that term in that language, which was used, that was fine. You know, so we're not really picky that, okay, you know, you want to call, for example, in Korean, the word for that God is Hanunim. So we're not going to go to Korean and say, no, no, don't use that word Hanunim, you must use Allah. No, if in your language Hanunim means that God who was fulfilling the same descriptions that we have of Allah, then that's okay. So it's, we don't have an issue. So Allah is not the God of Muslims. Right. It is the God. The God. This brings me, I can, I can think of that, and I can uh, see how there's a lot of misconception about the concept of God, because uh, even when we change the name, we change somehow the qualities and the understanding, because there's always this um, problem of, of terminology in different languages, because what it means in one language is probably different than what it means in other languages. Um, yes, Allah to them is an Arabic name, and that's why they call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the God of Arabs or the God of Muslims, when in fact, to us, He's the God of all. He is the one that has created uh, the earth. He's Allah al Khaliq al Bari al Musawwir al Malik. So He's got all these qualities the creation and the sustaining of this uh, world, and the charger who maintains everything. And He's the King. He is the one that has the ownership of everything in this life and controls everything that we do. No, no one has these qualities. You know, there could be a God who might die or a God that was God and is not God anymore, but Allah is God forever. Allah is, has been and will always be the God of this world. But we could add though that, I mean, when we use the term Allah, remember amongst the Arabs, they talked about the daughters of Allah. So, of course, we say that Jews who lived amongst Muslims, we could call them, you know, Jewish Arabs who lived, they spoke Arabic and they were Jews. The term they would use for God is also Allah. And Christians who lived amongst us, the Arab Christians, they call, we'll call them God Allah, Allah. also. Yeah. So it is, I mean, it's an Arabic term. We can hear it even in Aramaic and we can say, okay, even Jesus, because he belonged to a language group which was a sister group of Arabic. So that's, I think that brings us very importantly to, to the idea of rububiyyah as we see it in Islam, the three types of tawheed, rububiyyah, uluhiyyah, and asma' or sifat, in order to have all these three complete, in order to, to understand the concept of God, who's worthy of worship, right? Alhamdulillah, yeah, you, Brother Bilal mentioned uh, very nice, uh, many good points here. For instance, the atheists who say there is no God, the existence of the name of God in every tongue on the face of the globe, that is in itself is an explicit evidence. That in itself is an explicit evidence. No single language you'll find except there is a name refers to that supernatural being, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Every language. So that proves that it is something natural, something planted in the every human being that there is a creator. And also, I remember that one of the Muslim scholars, Imam Jafar Sadiq, he was debating with an atheist, and the atheist told him, I don't believe in God. Prove it to me. So he told him, well, have you ever traveled by sea? He said, yes. Have you ever experienced that you were going to drown? He said, yes. He said, did you get that feeling that there is someone, someone feeling inside you who's going to rescue you, your life, save your life? He said, yes. He said, that is God. Because at crucial moment, the reality will come out. The truth prevails. We are trying in our life to suppress it and to hide it, but at the crucial moment, it will come out. For instance, if we are now on board, God forbid, an announcement came, ladies and gentlemen, we have technical faults, first engine switched off, oh, now the second one. Imagine, and we have atheists and agnostic, what will happen? Everyone will start shouting, screaming, oh my God, oh my God. And one paratrooper, he wrote in his memoir in the Second World War, He's, he was a communist. He said, when I jumped, the parachute didn't open. And they started screaming, oh my God, oh my God, and then it opened. <laughs> Throughout his life, no God, no God, no God. 
But now it is a matter of life and death. Oh my God, you are the one only who can save my life. You know, that reminds me also of a saying by Gagarin, the famous uh, aeronautics, who actually was uh, one of the first Russian uh, astronauts to, to uh, land on the moon or to be in space. And what he said was, was very interesting. He said, well, I can believe now that there is God when he saw all the universe and the earth from far away and all these uh, galaxies and, and things that he has seen which are not really realized it could not be done by just uh, another being. It must be a supernatural being who created all of this. It would not be possible to be created by itself. This is exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about um, Tawheed of Rububiyya, which I raised to you both, and I can explain that because it's so central to Islamic uh, understanding. Tawheed Rububiyya, when everyone, as you started, uh, Dr. Bilal, that Tawheed Rububiyya, everyone believes there is God, and God who is the creator, and the sustainer, and the king, and all of that. But this was not enough, uh, because even the uh, Qurashi, uh, or Quraysh, the, the tribe of the family of the Prophet, peace be upon him, did believe in that. But they did, it was not enough, because he said, well, just don't say that, say la ilaha illallah. Say there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. It's not enough to say, well, we believe in the Creator, and then you can worship some other idols beside Him. That's not enough. You have to worship the one and only God worthy of worship, who's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the God of all. And then, besides that, He has certain qualities. You know, they said, when the Prophet, peace be upon him, introduced that, when he said, Ar-Rahman, I said, what is Ar-Rahman? We didn't know that name. He said, Rahman. It took him away from the concept of God, the compassionate. Well, God has all the perfect qualities, the beautiful names, and that is exactly what we see in our God as being the perfect, as being the absolute, as being the sovereign. All of these qualities that lead us into the belief that God is the one who is uh, mastering this world and it's not just only the God or the gods of the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Christian and the Jews and the atheists and the agnostics. Who is the God of all? Well, you know, the point that commonly happens from my experience uh, with regards to people's beliefs in other than God being God is that people tend to judge their gods according to their personal experiences. So if a person prays to Jesus, a human being, and his prayers are answered, then he feels, well, definitely this must be my God. Just as if somebody else prays to Ganesh, the elephant head God of the Hindus, you know, and his prayers are answered, he feels, well, therefore my God exists, you know. But the point is that if somebody prays to anything, a stick or a stone or anything, if prayers are answered, does that make that stick or stone their God, really not, God? No, not, not at all. No. So the ultimate understanding of God has to go beyond human experience because the human experience is, is influenced by the culture in which they are raised. They have to come to... Uh, understand God as God is. And that's why prophets were sent. And that's why messages were conveyed. And that's why those messages were uh, spread to various nations and tribes around the world. And that's why Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, came with that final message because the previous messages had been corrupted. So in order to get that clear message of who God is across, then it was preserved in the Quran, which remained unchanged. And the message which was given to the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, was given at a time when it was possible for it to be taken to all corners of the earth. Yeah, it's a nice thing. I would also like to add something here, which is every human being experiences. it. When you are under distress and you have troubles, you have problems, have you ever Notice yourself that you're looking up. Always. You have oh, looking up. Why? Where are you looking up? 
It is something natural, something you feel that something, there is something, someone who's going to help me, something will come from up. And this exactly, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he said also, that when you die, you look up as well. Any dying person who is dying, see his eyes. Because he says, the sight will follow the soul. The soul will not go to the right, will not go to the left, will go up to its creator. So to solve our problems, we have always to be, remain attached and link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator. We should not be deceived by our real enemy, the cursed enemy, who brought down our father from heaven to earth, which is the shaitan. And the shaitan, he is a very crafty guy. And he has many techniques. Imagine, he's still alive. How many thousands of years he has been misleading people? I have, uh, just, uh, just I remembered that a few years ago, somewhere on this planet, there was, uh, uh, idols were drinking milk, thirsty idols. People, they put the milk, the milk disappears. They put more and more and more, and no milk is there. So who drinks the milk? The stone? Allah has given us gray matter. What if I don't worship this idol? What will happen? Well, that, that to me seems like there are more tests that we're put through. In other words, uh, these are challenges that will face every human being in their own search for God, although it is instilled in their own spirit that God is in the heaven. God is up. As the Prophet, peace be upon him, asked this little girl yeah. who said, you know, where is Allah? Where is God? She said, up in the heaven. She said, she's a believer. Every little child. So they are born with that natural way. And, and alhamdulillah, as we have that instinct within our hearts, and we have the evidence, as Dr. Bilal was mentioning. Now that we have these messages, we have to uh, study them. We have to scrutinize these things for our own benefit. But there will not be any guidance to humanity unless they take the right step towards Allah, towards God, the Creator, in order to worship Him. Otherwise, they would be satisfied with any little thing that we have because you could have your own little God. To some people, by the way, who even claim to be Muslims, as I can see it, some people as if they are worshiping their own business, their own wives, their own children, their own uh, money, bank account, whatever lavish style they may have, or even little thing or big thing they may have in their own possession, they think, I'm happy with it, I'm satisfied with it. And that is taking me away from worshiping Allah. Allah.